Hey, welcome everybody to the next lecture on our lecture on channel coding graph-based codes. Today we're going to introduce the channel models and the channel models are crucial for developing channel coding schemes because they describe the system over which we want to transmit our data. And if we have a good model and a good description of our system, the easier it gets to design coding schemes. So the whole process of channel modeling has its roots in something called information theory. And we will see information theory later in the course of the lecture in more detail. But information theory really is around modeling communication systems using very simple models and using essentially very simple probabilistic models. So we assume that the transmission system is a probabilistic device and we use probability theory to model the behavior of this device. Later, we'll analyze information content and we will use information theory to derive something we call achievable rate, which is the amount of data we can transmit over a channel. Information theory can be used also in different contexts. It can be used in representation of information, so how much information a certain source or system has, and um, it can be also used for compression schemes. So uh, we will first look at some of the channel models that we consider, and we'll give some of the applications later. So the notation that we're going to use in this lecture, we will use uppercase letters to denote random variables. So a random variable RV is an uppercase letter. Whenever we have a random experiment, and the random variable gives an outcome, we'll use a lowercase letter. So X is a lowercase letter. And then the probability that the random variable X takes on a value lowercase x is written as P of X that the random variable X takes on the value X. This is a very redundant notation. So this is always very cluttery. And if we want to use this, it's not very useful. So if it's uh, clear from the context, we will abbreviate. So either we'll write just P of X because the random variable has the same letter, just uppercase as X. Um, we can let this X, because that one is redundant, um, we can leave it away. So either we'll write PX of X this way. So to um, subscript denotes the random variable, or we'll say P of X equals X, so the probability that the random variable takes on value X. And we will use the abbreviated version to keep the X position of the lecture simple. We have the probability density functions, we'll denote them as FX of X. And uh, if we have a CDF, yeah. cumulative density function, we'll denote them as upper case letter F, F of X, because of this relationship that the CDF is the integral of the PDF. That's why we're using uppercase letter. So Fx of x is the integral from minus infinity to x of the PDF, lowercase x, Fx of tau d tau. Or it's the probability that the random variable x takes on a value that is smaller or equal than some threshold x. So what is a communication channel? A communication channel is a channel, is a system that has an input X. So communication channel, system with an input X, and output Y. And the output Y depends probabilistically on the input X. So we have an input X, we have an output Y, and there is a probabilistic relationship between the input and the output. We can characterize it by a probability transition matrix, which gives the probability that a certain output occurs, given that a certain input has occurred. And that's essentially everything we need to describe a channel. So we have a system with a certain input X, we have an output Y, and they are related in a probabilistic way. We will look at one class of channels in particular. So we'll look at a class that's called memoryless channels. 
which means that the probability density function of the output depends only of the input at the same time. And it's independent, conditionally independent of the previous inputs. So it means when we transmit a symbol x, the output y only depends on x and not on the symbols that we have transmitted before. Everything that has been transmitted before has no influence on the channel. The channel is said to have no memory, which means it doesn't save any information. This is not true for uh, many systems. So in practice, often, for instance, you can assume that you have a capacitor somewhere in the, in the transmission line. And whenever you transmit a charge, so you uh, charge your um, transmitter, you have voltage at the transmitter, the capacitor is charged, and you will have this exponential decay of the capacitor, which means that the output Y will depend on the input after some time. This is something we will not look at. We assume that all the transient effects, all the time dependent effects are fast enough such that they are um, negligible after we have transmitted symbol X. So we transmit the symbol X, we receive Y, and Y only depends on X and not on what was transmitted before. Um, as I said, in practice, this may not hold always, but we can make it hold by using a technique that is called interleaving. And with this technique called interleaving, where we just um, yeah, change, permute the order of the input samples and unpermute, this influence um, gets removed or gets probabilistically removed. So we can formally define this memoryless channel. So um, we transmit a sequence of T symbols. So we have a sequence of T symbols. So we group them into a vector X, which is X1, X2, Xt up to X uppercase T. That's a sequence of symbols we transmit. And then, of course, we observe an output sequence. So we observe an output sequence Y, which is also uppercase T, capital T symbols. Receive the first symbol, y1, receive the second symbol, y2, third symbol, y3, and so on. So now if we have a memoryless channel, what we can do is we can write this conditional probability p of vector y given vector x. So if we look at the probability that we receive a certain sequence y, given that we have transmitted a certain sequence x, we can write this probability as the, in, the product of the individual probabilities. It's the product of P of yt given xt. So and this is a very crucial relationship. And this relationship is very important. For what reason? The main reason is that without this assumption, we cannot do many things. So we need this assumption to derive most of the decoders. If we don't have this assumption, getting decoders, deriving good and optimal decoders gets extremely hard, if not impossible. So we need this relation to get good decoders. So this is a very crucial relationship and it's very important to remember that one. So what it means again is the sequence, the probability of the received sequence, given the received, the transmitted um, sequence, is the product of the individual probabilities. So it means that this y at time t only depends on x at time t, and no other symbols before. So if we look closer, what we can do is we can use the conditional the chain rule of conditional probabilities, we can write P of Y given X this is equal to P of Y one up to Y T given X one up to X T and using the chain rule of conditional probability, we can write that this is the product from t equals 1 to capital T of p of yt given 
x1 up to xt and y1 up to yt minus 1. So this is an equivalent relationship. And now we use the assumption that yt, this yt only depends on some xt, but not on x1, not on x2, not on x capital T, and also not on the previous channel outputs. So only depends on the previous channel input, yt given xt. All the other inputs are not important and don't influence the channel output. So here we use this memory less less. Okay, so this is a very important property and essentially all the channels, channel models we are looking at, they behave memoryless. And we were going to see um, only memoryless channel models and also in practice, you will work with memoryless channels only. There exist memory channels with memory in practice and um, to the best of my knowledge, and I've worked with such channels before, um, it is close to impossible to derive decoders or transmission schemes for such channels. So whatever you try to do is make the channel memoryless or try to find some good um, compensation methods for the memory. So then um, we look at the uh, transmission and uh, the channel model is an abstraction of the real transmission, the practical transmission. So if we look at a transmission scheme, transmission scheme always works in the same way. So we have an analog part that constitutes the real transmission and we want to app extract this analog part as much as possible because we want to state everything in the discrete. So we have a transmission symbol xi that we would like to transmit. And this transmission symbol xi belongs to some set x, which contains v possible transmit symbols. So x1 up to xv. And that is the channel input alphabet. So the channel has an input x and its input is discrete and it's taken from some alphabet that we denote by x and it has v symbols. Then we modulate x and by modulating we get an analog waveform. So C of t and uh, you may recall modulation, so you may recall that C of t is equal to the sum from taken from minus infinity to plus infinity, and this is um, x k times g of t minus k times capital T. So what you do, what we do is we take a pulse shaping filter g and we multiply this pulse shaping filter by x of t and um, then we sum up the different contributions. And we may do this in both in-phase and quadrature components. Um, that's not so important for us because uh, we are not looking into those details. This is something we do in communications engineering. Here we're just taking the view point on the discrete symbols x. Then on the channel we assume that there is some process that adds noise then we get a received waveform v of t, nu of t, we demodulate to get again a baseband waveform. So here possibly we also have some modulation inside so that c of t is equal to the real part of this guy times e to the power j 2 pi f0 t. So um, we can have it more and more complicated. Then we can, uh, we have the transmission over the channel, we demodulate, and then we sample. So the demodulator usually contains something called the matched filter. So um, after matched filtering, we sample, 
and then we make a decision. So we have an analog to digital conversion. The decision maker essentially is an A to D converter. And we get a YI and YI belongs to a set Y, which is defined to contain one over one out of W possible output symbols. So we have input, which is discrete, and the output after A to D conversion is also discrete. That's the channel, and we will do an equivalent model of this channel. So we have a channel output alphabet Y, contains W different output symbols, and then based on this channel output alphabet, we can define a discrete transmission model. So the discrete model is the following. So that's the one we consider. We'll not look at the whole transmission chain. We look at a model that has an input xi and an output yj. And um, yj can be either a 0 or 1 decision, but yj can also be an A to D converter, for instance, with 16 levels, with 256 levels, even with more levels then we, we call it a soft decision. So W is usually larger or equal than V. And when W is considerably larger than V, we call it a soft decision. Okay. So this is how the model looks like. So we have the model, and essentially we have a source that transmits this Xi, and we receive Yi. And everything we need to characterize this channel is the probability P of yj given xi. So we have P of yj given xi, and that's the probability that yj is received given that xi has been transmitted. And that's all we need to characterize our channel. So for every different of the vx, for every different of the Ws, we have a probability P of yj given xi. So um, for this, of course, we have some property. So the first, of course, means that if we sum over all j, P of yj given xi must be equal to 1. This must hold for every xi. So um, in the extreme case, and here we assume that W is equal to V, when we don't have an error, then this, the channel is deterministic, which means P of yj given xi is equal to 1 for some i equal to j. And otherwise, it is equal to 0. So then we can group all these probabilities into a matrix P, which we call the channel transition matrix. And this matrix is of size W times V. And essentially, we put in the column number I, column I, we put the W distinct PYJ given XI. So each column corresponds to one input symbol, one input symbol, second input symbol, third input symbol, and so on. And the different rows correspond to the different output symbols. So the entry at row J and column I is P of YJ given X. So this defines our channel. What we also have is we have the channel input. So we have a the Source symbols that you transmit, they can occur with different probabilities. So we define the input probability vector Px, which is just the probability that the source symbol takes on value x1, probability that source symbol takes on value x2, probability that source symbol takes on value x3, and so on. So that's the input probability vector. So here's an example. We have 
two transmit symbols, so V is equal to two, and W is equal to three output symbols. So we have a ternary decision, and we have three output symbols. So let me make a little bit of space here. Um, this mishap with the slides, um, sorry for this, but we'll get around this. So we have two channel inputs, X1 and X2, and we have three output symbols, Y1, Y2, Y3, and we have probabilities that X1 is, or probability that Y1 is received given that X1 has been transmitted, is one half, probability that Y2 has been uh, transmitted, uh, received, given that X1 has been transmitted, is one third. Probability that Y3 is received, given that X1 has been transmitted, is one over six. And this is the probability transition matrix. So we have two columns for the two input symbols, X1 and X2. And then each row corresponds to one output symbol. So we have um, Y1, Y2, and Y3, and we can see that we group the probabilities, and I use two different colors to describe and keep apart the different probabilities. So this is the channel transition matrix. And now we can calculate the probability that the different Y1s occur. That's the output probability vector, probability that Y1 is equal to y is equal to y1, probability that y is equal to y2, y is equal to y3, and so on. And that's just multiplying this probability transition matrix with the vector px, which contains the input probabilities. And that's because we can marginalize. So we marginalize p of yj is equal to the sum over all i p of xi times yj, so this is marginalization, law of total probability. And then we apply Bayes' theorem to this guy. So this is just the application of Bayes' theorem. So recall, Bayes' theorem says that p of x given y is p of x comma y divided by p of y and um, by rearranging a little bit um, this is equal to then um, we can also write it and it's a little bit in a different way so we can also write it as p of y given x and then we need to divide by p of x so just by rearranging it that bit then we get this expression so it's the sum of all i, p of yj given xi, times p of xi. Okay, so we have this now, and um, this is the output probability vector. Okay, so then uh, we're looking mostly at the, or we can define a special class of channels, which are symmetric channel. So a symmetric channel is a memoryless channel, and it has a channel transition matrix where all the columns are permutations of each other, and all the rows are permutations of each other. Then we call it a symmetric channel. So um, we can weaken this definition a little bit. We have a weakly symmetric channel. Again, we need that every column of P is a permutation of every other column of P. So the columns, they must be permutations of each other. And we want the row sums all to be equal. So the sum over all Xi of P of Y given Xi must be equal. So we fix an output symbol and we looking at all the um, the input symbol x. They must all be equal. So recall that what we have is that the sum, we have the sum over all j of p of yj given some specific x 
This must be equal to 1. This is not the sum we are looking at. In this sum, we fix x, we fix the input, and then say, all. if we sum up over the probabilities of all the outputs, we must get 1. Here, we're looking at the other way around. We fix the output, and we sum over all the inputs. So we sum over all the columns. Then these sums must be equal. And uh, this is a weaker definition because if all the rows are permutations of each other, then of course they have the same sum. So uh, if we have a symmetric channel, it will also be weakly symmetric. So let's take a look at an example. This is a symmetric channel. We can see the first column has three entries, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.2. Then we have a permutation of the first column. This is a permutation of the second column. If we're looking at the rows, this 0, 3, 0, 2, 0, 5. The second row is a permutation of the first row. The third row is a permutation of the first row. And the second row by induction. So this is actually a weak uh, symmetric channel. Now we're looking at a weakly symmetric channel. So weakly symmetric channel, we're looking at the columns. They must be permutations of each other. So first column, one third, one half, one sixth. Second column, one third, one sixth, one half. Clearly a permutation. Then we're looking at the row sums. So this is um, the summation is equal to one third plus one third. This is two thirds. Here we have one half plus one sixth. So this is three sixths plus one sixth, four sixths. This is equal to two thirds. And then the third one is one, half, one sixth plus one half. This is also equal to two thirds. So all the row sums are equal. And you can verify that the column sums, they are equal to one both, which is by definition, this holds for every matrix P. But here we can clearly see that the row sums, they are actually equal. So this is a weakly symmetric channel. All right. So next, um, we're looking at some common channel models. And we'll mostly look at uh, three channel models. And um, essentially four channel models, and most of them are symmetric, but not all of them are symmetric. So um, we're looking at mostly these guys of channels. These three channels, they have the property that V is equal to two and W is equal to two. So we have two input symbols and two output symbols. Um, so these three channels. And then we're looking at the last channel, which is the very famous AWGN channel. For the very famous AWGN channel, sorry. We have actually also, the way we're looking at it, we're looking at a special case of the AWGN channel, the binary input AWGN channel. And in this one, we have V is equal to two and W goes to infinity. So we have essentially a continuous channel output. In practice, you will not have, in practice, you will have a, um, in practice, you will have a analog to digital converter with a limited resolution. So we have a quantization of the channel output and uh, usually you have uh, two power 16 or two power 14 um, representation levels of the channel output. Um, but uh, it turns out that this W going to infinity can simplify many things in the analysis again, as long as we keep the V discrete. If the V is not analog or continuous, um, things get easy. But in this case, if we keep W going to infinity, we have a continuous output, it will simplify things. And we will also see that it's a very, very good approximation of the um, limited resolution practical case. So let's dive into these channel models. 
When you use symmetric channel, you may know it already from communication engineering. One is very, very simple channel. That's the channel. And essentially we have two inputs, x equals zero and x equals one. So, uh, so x equals zero, x equals one, and we have the transition probabilities. So with probability delta, we make an error. So with probability delta, we transmit a zero, but receive a one. And with probability delta, we transmit a one, but receive a zero. So that's the probability delta, and that's probability delta. And with probability one minus delta, we don't make an error. So this was essentially one of the very, very first channel models that has been developed in the 1940s of the past century. And um, the main reason for introducing this channel model was essentially storage devices, and in particular, modeling faulty memory cells. So in the 1940s, uh, Richard Hemming, he was working on a electromechanical computer and the different memories each bit was stored in a um, each bit was stored in a relay so an electromechanical device and the relay can be either closed or open and then it stores a one or it stores a zero but because the relay is a mechanical device so there is like kind of a switch that with a, when you in apply voltage you can change the switch and uh, this can become unreliable because the mechanics can become uh, yeah, not working anymore. They can get stuck. There can also be um, something that uh, gets stuck inside and then it doesn't flip anymore. And uh, with some probability, these relays, they didn't flip anymore. And this is what Hamming modeled using this binary symmetric channel. It is used today also for modeling communication systems, but the origins come from um, storage devices. So that's the first channel, the channel transition matrix is given here. So we have a channel transition matrix P, which is one minus delta, 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 and one minus delta. And it's a very clear example of a symmetric channel. Okay, that was the first channel. The second channel, is the binary erasure channel. And actually I made a mistake on my previous slide. So um, this is something I shouldn't have said. Um, so we had seen this, this channel has V is equal to two and W is equal to two. And this one has V equals two and W equals three. So the binary erasure channel actually has three output symbols. So V is equal to two, two input symbols, a zero and a one, and three output symbols, a zero, a one, and a question mark. And uh, when we look closer, what happens is that the data, a zero, is either transmitted correctly, so either we receive a zero, or we receive a question mark. So and with probability epsilon, we receive a question mark. With probability one minus epsilon, we receive a zero. The same for the one. With probability one minus epsilon, we receive a one. And with probability epsilon, we receive a question mark. So either the data is received correctly or it's lost, meaning we receive a question mark and we cannot infer anything about the transmit symbol. So um, this seems like a very simple and impractical model, but essentially it has a um, yeah, it has some very high usefulness, and the usefulness comes from the modeling of networks and internet traffic. And a question mark essentially means a packet loss. So you want to transmit data, and some of the data is lost because, for instance, you have a congestion in the network. And you have a router in the middle and it, the router has a, a queue and the data comes flowing into the queue and at some point in time it cannot handle the data fast enough so it can only transmit outgoing data to uh, other nodes 
but eventually you will it will get stuck. So the data will get stuck and you will not be able anymore to transmit new data, but the, there's still data coming in. And um, then what happens is that the queue is being emptied. So incoming packets are thrown away and this is so-called packet loss. So it's a very good uh, model of these packet loss channels and um, can also be used for modeling a very good high signal to noise ratio channels where you only have uh, sometimes small errors and then you can model this error region using an erasure. So that's, as we're going to see, maybe that's what we do in optical communications. So that's the binary erasure channel. There we can write down the um, channel transition matrix and um, it's one minus epsilon, zero, epsilon, epsilon, and zero, one minus epsilon. So um, the columns are permutations of each other, but the rows are not. And also the sum of the rows, they are not equal unless in the very special case that epsilon is equal to one third. So it is no, neither a symmetric channel nor a weakly symmetric channel. So this is an example of a channel that's not symmetric and not weakly symmetric. So then the next channel we're looking at is the so-called Z channel. Seems to be like a toy model and uh, not of very practical relevance. Um, the name is obtained because this guy looks like Z. And in the Z channel, a zero is always received correctly. So when you have a zero, you will always receive a zero. When we have a one, with probability Q, we will receive a zero. And for probability one minus Q, we will receive a one. So zero is always received correctly. But the one is possibly subject to errors. So what possible application could this channel have? So it is a very frequent model in flash memory cells. So in flash memory, what you do is you store the data by injecting a charge in a semiconductor device. So in a kind of a, a, a yeah, transistor um, that contains and stores a charge. So it's a very special um, MOS um, that has a flash region and um, to be honest, I'm not too deep into the physics of how this is exactly working, but the big idea is that you store a charge in this uh, flash cell, and because of leakage, the charge can leak out of the charge, out of the, the cell. So if the charge leaks out of the cell, so it leaks somewhere else, it floats somewhere else in the circuit, um, the voltage or the charge level that is stored drops. So if the electrons, they leak out, the voltage drops and eventually it may drop low enough such that we don't recognize this charge anymore. So it drops below a certain threshold, which represents the one, and then we'll see a zero because there are not enough electrons left in the device. So this is um, why we'll have an error from a one that is stored with a charge, the charge leaks, and we'll get to the zero. And the, the opposite never occurs. There are no electrons that magically build up into this device going from zero to one. We'll only have the opposite case of leaking, but not of accumulating. So we'll never have um, a zero that is flipped to one, but the one is frequently flipped to a zero. So that's a channel model for flash memory cells. Um, we can also model it in visible light communications. So invisible light communications, there's an example. Um, this is actually when I was a student, we had a student dorm that was a big tower that was uh, inside the forest or a little bit on remote at the outskirts of the city. And uh, we didn't have a fiber connection to the um, main internet hub. So we were kind of isolated and um, here was the main internet hub, and what we had was a device that was based on visible light communication. So we had a tripod, and on the tripod was a laser. And um, here we have 
a, receive, a receiver that is essentially also a device that contains a photodiode and uh, it detects the presence of the light emitted by the laser. So this laser was transmitting and it was transmitting using something called on-off keying. So whenever you want to transmit a light, one, you transmit a pulse of light. When you transmit a zero, you transmit nothing. So you transmit some pulses of light. Looks like this. And uh, you could see when you were online in your, um, you could see people were online when fog was coming up. So there was a cloud here somewhere. So there was fog coming up, all the internet connections went down and you could see your friends um, go offline. And this is because the fog absorbed the visible light and none of it reached the receiver anymore and uh, the receiver essentially saw nothing. When the zero was transmitted, the zero still came true because there was nothing to absorb. Only the ones were absorbed. So um, that's why this is also modeled by Z channel. So what may also happen is that there is a um, there is a bird flying through the pulse. So this should should be a bird, and uh, the bird will absorb the pulse. It will not be harmed. Um, don't worry. But one of the pulses may be absorbed by some object, um, by atmospheric effects, by a bird, and it will not reach the receiver anymore. So therefore, some pulses may be dropped. But if there is nothing to absorb, the bird can, nothing, can absorb nothing and a zero will still come as a zero. So the zeros will still be received correctly, but the ones may be absorbed. So that's the idea of a Z channel. So that's also something that is frequent and visible light communications is kind of having a, um, a comeback. We have LEDs as lightning and uh, LEDs can be used to transmit information by using very rapid changes in, um, yeah, uh, in the intensity that our eye doesn't perceive, but we also have point-to-point, -point, um, um, we have also point-to-point -point, um, communications between two objects. This is being used also for satellite-to-satellite -satellite communications. There are no birds in space, so they, that should be pretty um, safe there. Um, we also use for satellite to ground communications nowadays. So using um, optical communications because just the data rates are larger. You don't run into issues um, that you need spectrum that doesn't belong to you. And um, it simplifies many things while complicating others, but that's um, a technology that is still feasible and is still being used. Okay, so that's the Z channel. Um, to recapitulate, we have a probability transition matrix, P, it so contains one Q, zero and one minus Q. And this is again a channel that is neither symmetric nor weakly symmetric. Okay, so Z channel. Then we come to the um, AWGN channel. So here we have W equals two, V equals two, and W goes to infinity. No, and essentially, sorry, it's my, my mistake. So in the usual AWGN channel, we have an unconstrained input and we have an unconstrained output. So the input can be an analog signal, V goes to infinity and W goes to infinity. So as I said, we're not looking at that one. That's the baseline. That's the usual AWGN channel where we start from. And um, we're just looking first at the noise process. So the noise process is additive white Gaussian noise, AWGN. And it's a very common model because uh, we always have a lot of different noise processes. And when we add up different noise processes by the central limit theorem, the distribution of the sum gets Gaussian. So um, this is a model for satellite communications, for deep space communications, wireless communications, optical communications, and so on. So here, first, 
we assumed real value to channel input, but we'll specify this to be binary in the following. Um, before we do it so, we looking a little bit closer at the parameterization of the AWGN channel. So as I said, we assume the input to be real valued. You may wonder, um, okay, so in um, everything I saw, uh, I saw complex value channels. Yes, um, the channel itself is complex, but we assume that we modulate just the real value part, just to keep the exposition simple. There's no good reason for this, except keeping the exposition simple, because later we'll move to the simple case when we just transmit zeros and ones, and that's the simplest model we have. We'll um, see how that, um, how that relates to the complex case then also later. So we have a real valued input, and we assume that this input has a, a average energy, and that's ES. So ES is the average energy, and that's the expected value of X squared, or absolute value, the expectation of the X absolute value squared. And usually we normalize our channel input such that this average energy is equal to one. And then we add real valued Gaussian noise and we add Gaussian noise of variance sigma n squared. And here we assume implicitly that this noise process comes from a complex Gaussian. So it comes from a complex Gaussian with noise power two times sigma n squared. But we have already done receiver processing and we're just looking at the real part. So the complex part is taken care of somewhere else and we're just looking at the real part. And then we can define a value that is called ES over N0. So it's closely related to the single to noise ratio. And um, we define it ES over N0 is, is equal to ES over two times sigma N squared. And in the case where ES is equal to one, it's one over two times sigma n squared. And what we assume, we assume everything that um, in the analog transmission, like perfect pulse shaping, perfect match filtering, perfect synchronization, etc. So this is the important thing that yes over zero is one over two times sigma n squared. That's the way we define it here. Um, if we're looking at coding schemes, we'll often see a value that is called EB over N0. And EB over N0 is very often used instead of ES over N0 to compare coding schemes of different rates. Recall from last week, we have defined the rate. Just as a reminder, the channel encoder is a device that takes k input bits and generates n larger than k output bits. And it's characterized by a so-called rate r is equal to k over n. So then we can define two quantities. The first quantity is ES, that's the energy per transmitted symbol X, and EB is the energy per information bit U. So we take U information bits, encode them, and get N. So U is our input vector, we have K information bits, we encode them, and then we get N larger than k output bits. So we have k information bits and n code bits. So we need to, uh, we have a relationship between the energy at the input versus the energy at the output uh, because we don't change the energy. 
There's no energy that's being lost or generated. And so uh, the relationship we have is the following. We have K input bits. And we have K input bits and each information bit or input bit has energy EB. So the total energy at the input here is K times EB. For every of the K information bits, we have an energy EB. And then we encode at the output, we have N output bits and every output bit has energy ES. So the total energy is N times ES. And these two must be equal. So K times EB must be equal to N times ES. So and what we can do now is we can divide both sides by N0. And then we get the following relationship. We get that ES over N0 is equal to K over EN times EB over N0, which is the rate of the code times EB over N0. So again, this is an extremely important relationship. And this is also one that you should know by heart. And to be honest, I have been working on channel coding for 15 years now. I still don't remember this one. I always need to derive it myself using this relationship. So always in my mind, I'm looking at in my head, looking at this diagram, putting up this relationship, K times EB is equal to N times ES, then quickly doing the division and then I get this. I never remember this one, um, but always go to these steps in my mind. But um, if you are able to recall this relationship, because that's a very important relationship. Okay, so um, we're looking at an example, actually looking at two examples. So assume we want to transmit 100 information bits using a total energy of 100 Joule. So we have, this means that we have one Joule per information bit. So it means that our EB is equal to one Joule. So now assume we have a code of rate one half. So this means we have 100 bit at the input. We encode and we have 200 bit at the output of rate one half. So from 100 bit, we generate 200 bits. So what we do is we take our 100 Joule at the input and we use those 100 Joule to transmit 200 coded bits or symbols. So it means ES is equal to 100, 100 Joule divided by 200 symbols is equal to half a Joule. And this is equal to R times EB. So that's how you can also looking at the relationship by thinking of um, in a more physical way. Um, we can also look at it from a slightly different perspective. So we can also looking at the way that we would like to transmit 100 coded symbols using a transmit of 100 Joule. And that's the, uh, that's the perspective you usually take on when you come from the hardware. So when you come from a more practical point of view, um, because you have a power budget of how much power you can launch over the antenna. That's something that is physical power. So 
And this power directly relates to the coded symbols because these are the ones that you transmit. So this is something that you will often encounter in practice. But if you're looking at different schemes in terms of energy per bit, the other perspective may be useful. So now what we're looking at is we have an ES of one joule. So we use one joule per information symbol. And we're looking at a slightly different example. So now we're looking at an example. Um, we have a code of rate one over four. So we have K bit at the input. And we generate 100 symbols at the output. Bits. We use bits and symbols um, equivalently. So the rate of this guy is k over 100, and we know it's 1 over 4. So it means that our k is equal to 25 bit or symbols. So we can calculate our energy per bit. So energy per bit, EB, is equal to the total energy, we have 100 Joule, divided by 25 input symbols, so it's 4 Joule. So every bit, every information bit that we transmit has the equivalent of 4 Joule, because it gets coded and it gets transformed into 4 symbols that we actually transmit, and each we transmit it with one joule, so the total energy per bit is four joule. So I hope these different perspectives get clear. Um, it's uh, a little bit uh, mind twisting in the beginning when you start looking at it, but once you get used to it and you calculate a few of those examples, it tends to get um, very easy to get a grasp of it. Okay, so now we're looking at um, the channel that we are actually interested in, and that's the binary input AWGN channel. So here we transmit a binary input. So V is equal to 2, finally, and still W goes to infinity. So and V is equal to 2, meaning we transmit 0 or 1, but we don't transmit 0 or 1 um, because we transmit plus 1 or minus 1 like a binary phase shift key, BPSK, which we know from communication engineering. And uh, we usually assume the following mapping. So whenever we transmit a zero, we map the zero to a plus one. Whenever we want to transmit a binary one, we map it to minus one. It seems a little bit counterintuitive why we do it that way. Um, that has a very nice representation that the binary addition can be represented as multiplication of its uh, bipolar values. And we also get this um, bipolar values by um, minus 1 to the power b. So if you have a bit value of b, just calculate minus 1 power b or 1 minus 2b. That's different, uh, both are equivalent. And uh, we'll see um, this in action later. So we can um, neglect this for the time being, just assume that we have the following mapping. So we have our plus one or minus one, and then we add a Gaussian noise. N distributed according to Gaussian to this binary input. That's the binary input AWGN channel. And that's the main channel that people looking at in channel coding. So that's the main channel example. Okay, so this is the um, channel model because we would like to transmit binary data in practice. Now, if we have this channel, we can um, evaluate coding schemes using so-called waterfall curves. So first we're looking at a um, 
system that is uncoded. So we can represent our uncoded transmission in terms of ES over N0 or in terms of EB over N0. So here we see that the uncoded curve is the same because if you have no coding, uncoded means trade is equal to one. And that means that um, EB is equal to ES. And then we have an example code. If I'm not mistaken, the rate of this example code is four over seven. So actually here EB is different from ES. And we see that the curves shift because here EB is different from ES. And we see that the performance is different in terms of EB of N0 versus ES of N0. Here we give EB of N0 in decibel. And if you want to calculate the value in decibel, then we do the following. ES of N0 in decibel is equal to 10 times log 10. Use 10 as a multiplier because we are in the power domain. So ES and N0, they are energy values, so they are already squared. That's why we use 10, because the square is inside the ES. And then we have ES over N0. Same thing for EB over N0. So we can just replace S by B. So that's how you transform from decibel to, um, to linear. And of course, you can invert this relationship. So ES over N0 is equal to 10 to the power 10 power up. So ES over N0 in decibel divided by 10. Just inverting the relationship. And try to look at this difference that we see and try to calculate this difference um, by hand. So here you have this, this code has a bit error rate performance of 12 EB of N0 at this value here. And here we have a gap, here we are at nine point something. So there is a gap of roughly 2.5, um, 2.3 dB. And that's because of the rate of the code, which is four over seven in this case. We see some theoretical limit here. Um, don't bother about that one. We don't know yet how to calculate that one we'll see that this is a theoretical limit of how this curve can behave in the best possible of all cases. Um, we see that there is quite some space and this is a space that we're going to close in this lecture. Okay, so we have these waterfall curves and uh, with these waterfall curves, we can define something that is called the coding gain. So the coding gain is defined to be the gain in ES over N0. So the gain in ES over N0 at a defined target bit error rate compared with an uncoded transmission. And the net coding gain is defined as the gain in EB over N0 at a certain target bit error rate. So we can calculate the bit error rate of the uncoded transmission that's one half the complementary error function of the square root of ES over N0. Again, try to replicate the plot. Uh, if you have MATLAB, it's very easy. It has the complementary error function included. Just um, generate the previous plot. Try to generate the previous plot by yourself. So that's something if you um, you could try to do yourself. We can discuss this in discussion session. So replicate plot of slide 25. 
it is the uncoded case, the coded one not, but the uncoded curve. That will give you a feeling of how to calculate with decibels. That will give you a feeling also how to manipulate the complementary error function to get a bitter rate of the uncoded transmission. So we can looking at the coding gain and um, a bitter rate of 10 to power minus 8 and the coding the net coding gain at the same bitter rate. So we do this at the previous slide. So looking at 10 to the power minus 8. Oops. So this is the ah sorry, I miss there we go. This is the coding gain. So this is roughly 3.1 dB. And the net coding gain is the one that we see over here. So just this tiny, um, so it has been smaller. And that's the um, net coding gain of 0 0.7 decibel. So why is the net coding gain smaller? Because if we apply coding, we need to invest additional energy to transmit the extra bits. This is not being accounted for in the coding gain. The coding gain, we're just looking at the raw numbers. But in the net coding gain, we take into account that we actually need to spend extra energy or equivalently extra bandwidth to transmit the extra data that is generated by the code, so-called parity bits or redundant bits. So this is being taken into account for, and this reduces the gain because we need to do some extra effort, but we see there is some gain. So by doing the coding and by spending this extra effort, we get this extra gain. And this extra gain is worth the effort. It could well be that this whole coding doesn't make sense that we don't get a gain because we could maybe correct less errors but um, transmit additional information so we may end up somewhere here if the code is not very powerful but luckily the code is powerful and we get this small gain and this small gain helps us improve our system performance how to do the code how to realize the code this is something we're going to see in the next chapter So we have this coding gains of 3.1 dB and the net coding gain of 0 0.7 dB. So here is uh, also another illustration of this coding gain. So this is a different code. The rate is 4 over 5. And this is actually a practical code. So this is a real code that I simulated. And uh, you can see the, the behavior of what is going on. So we're looking at the uncoded um, curve. So we have the uncoded uh, transmission. That's the one here. And now we code the, the, the guy. So what we do is we take our um, data. So we have a say k is equal to 10,000. And we have a rate of 4 over 5 code. So for four information bits, we get five output bits. So in this case, that means that n is equal to 12,500. Um, so what we have now is we have the following block structure. So we have 10,000 bits, and this is our information, and our code just adds 2,500 redundancy bits. So what we can do now is we can just transmit this one 
12,500 bits. And um, you can just transmit those 12,500 bits. And uh, at the receiver, we can just looking at those guys. And we just throw away the redundancy bits. We'll not use them. So and that's the red curve here. That's coded without decoding. So now we see that we actually get worse. And we have a quite considerable gap here between the two curves. And this gap is because this curve is in terms of EB over N0. So when doing the coding, we can spend less energy per bit. The energy per bit we spend decreases because we need to spend energy to transmit those redundancy bits. So, and then we have a performance loss because we have less energy per bit. The amount of noise gets larger. And by having more noise, we cannot, uh, our error rate gets higher. So, the coded curve without decoding is actually worse than the uncoded. But now we apply decoding. So now we will actually use those redundancy bits for decoding. And then we get the green curve. That's actually quite a dramatic gain. And we see that we get a coding gain of roughly 13 dB or decibels. So from 16 to 3 dB at a bit rate of 10 to power minus 15. This is a usual target bit rate in networking applications, optical communications. And if we're looking at the net coding gain, that's the gain compared to the uncoded transmission without coding, that's 11.9 dB. So still a dramatic increase in terms of coding gain. Of course, we lose a little bit. We lose this amount because of transmitting the extra redundancy bits, um, but we get a dramatic net coding gain of 12 dB. So that's the definition of the net coding gain. Okay, so with this, now we're looking at the final channel model, and that's the hard decision binary input AWGN channel. It's the same binary input AWGN channel, but now we add a decision here. So we make a binary decision and we output a zero or a one. So recall that the input, um, if we have a bit of zero, that means that X is equal to plus one. And we have a bit of one that we'd like to transmit. X is equal to minus one. So and now we make a decision. So it means that the input is binary, V is equal to 2, and the output W is also binary, so W is also equal to 2. Okay, so um, what does that mean? So let's take a look at this channel in detail. So assume we transmit um, X equals minus one, which corresponds to a bit of bit value of one. Then we have the following situation. Um, so let me draw this here. So we have following situation. This is this is uh, this is x. So we transmit minus one. Zero, this is plus one. And would like to plot P of Y tilde given X. So Y tilde is this guy. So that's after the noise. Plot the probability density function of Y tilde given X. And um, in particular, we have that X is equal to minus one. So we know that we have AWGN channel. 
we have something like this. This should be a Gaussian distribution, kind of Gaussian distribution, and this is um, sigma n squared. So it has variance of sigma n squared. And now we make a decision. So the decision means that y is equal to zero if so zero means we transmit a plus one we say that y is equal to zero if um, y tilde is large or equal than zero and y is equal to one if y tilde is smaller than zero so that's the decision so we just make a threshold if y tilde is positive, we decide for zero. If y tilde is negative, we decide for one. So now we can calculate the probability of error. So we can calculate delta, which is the probability that y is decided to be equal to zero, given that x is equal to minus one, or given that b is equal to one. So this is equivalent to b is equal to one. So that's the probability that we make an error. And if we have transmitted a minus one, that's the probability that we have a y tilde that is positive. And that's this probability. So we can calculate that one. We know the distribution. So that's the distribution, the integral from zero to infinity of so here um, just writing this, this is um, this is actually f of y tilde. So this is f of um, let me write it in. Yeah. This is f of y tilde of um, y tilde given x equals minus 1 dy tilde. This is equal to, now we insert the Gaussian distribution. So it's equal to 1 over square root of 2 pi sigma n times the integral from 0 to infinity e to the power minus y tilde plus 1 squared because we shift to minus 1. Minus 1 is the center. So that's why we have plus 1 here divided by 2 sigma n squared dy tilde. Okay, now uh, in order to calculate this integral, we substitute. So we substitute um, z is equal to y tilde plus 1 divided um, by sigma n. It means that dz divided by dy tilde is equal to 1 over sigma n. So we do the substitution, and then we get that delta is equal to, so we have one over square root of two pi times sigma n times the integral. So uh, y tilde started at zero. So we need to insert uh, the zero. To insert the zero, insert zero in this expression. So this would be one over sigma n. So we start with one over sigma n. And if we plug infinity, plug infinity into this expression, we get infinity plus one over sigma n, which will still be infinity. So 
Um, we have infinity, um, we have the bounds of the integral. So then we can have the integrand. So this is one minus z squared divided by two. And then we replace dy tilde by dz. dy tilde is sigma n, therefore we can say that dy tilde is sigma n times dz. So we write dz and sigma n doesn't depend on z, so we can move it in front of the integral. So we can say that we put it over there. So we have sigma n here and um, we can cancel it. And this is nothing else as q of one over sigma n. What is q? q is the so-called q function. So recall q is the tail function of the Gaussian distribution. So we have q of x is the integral from x to infinity and um, factor one over square root of two pi is the integral from x to infinity of um, e to the power minus tau squared divided by two d tau. That's the definition of the q function. And the q function is a function that is implemented in most, um, most mathematical toolboxes, for instance, MATLAB. And it's also closely related to the arrow function, as we're going to see. Um, if you prefer to work with the arrow function, you can use the arrow function. I like to work with the q function. So um, you can express it as a q function. So essentially what we do is we can calculate the probability um, that y is equal to zero if we have transmitted the one. And we can also calculate the other probability, probability that, we, that y is equal to one, given that we have transmitted plus one. And both of those are um, symmetric. And essentially what we get is, we get that this channel is equivalent to a binary symmetric channel. So what we do is we convert this hard decision, converts this channel into a binary symmetric channel with an error probability delta, which is Q of one over sigma n. We can express sigma n in terms of ES over n zero. So it's equivalently at the square root of two power two times ES over n zero. We can express this in terms of EB over n zero. And finally, we can express it in terms of the complementary error function because the Q function and the complementary error function, they are very closely related. So it's one half times complementary error function of square root of E S over N zero. And the Q function is given here. That's the one that I just defined. So that's the tail distribution function of the normal distribution. So that's the, um, that's the, um, hard decision binary input AW gen channel. So it's essentially nothing else as a binary symmetric channel with a delta that depends on the ES over N0 parameter. Okay, so we have one final thing that we would like to calculate, and that's the so-called Batakaria parameter. The Batakaria parameter is a, is a parameter that tells us how good or bad the channel is how noisy or not noisy the channel is. So the Batakaria parameter is uh, defined only for channels with V is equal to two. So we calculate the Batakaria parameter only for channels with V equals two. And for this, we can it in the following way. So we have a binary input channel called C, and we have an output alphabet Y with W possible output values. 
And then the butter career parameter is defined um, for discrete um, channel as the sum over all possible output values. Then we have the square root of p of y given x equals 0 times p of y given x equals 1. So we sum over all possible y, then we calculate p of y equals y given x equals 0 times p of y equals y given x equals 1. If we have a continuous output, so for instance, a WGN channel with binary inputs, then we just replace the summation with the integral over all possible y's. That's it. So we calculate the butter career parameter for a binary symmetric channel. So we have a binary symmetric channel with error probability delta. And we can calculate the butter career parameter. So we have the square root first for channel output 0. So p of y equals 0 times given x equals 0 times p of y equals 0 given x equals 1. Plus the square root that y is equal to 1. So p of y equals 1 given x0 times p of y equals 1 um, given x equals 1. So this guy, this guy is equal to uh, 1 minus delta. And uh, because this is this does not represent an error, let's make this green. Um, so this is 1 minus delta. This is 1 minus delta. This guy is delta. This guy is delta. So we have the square root of delta times 1 minus delta. And we have two times this guy. So the butter career parameter of the channel delta is of the BSC is 2 times the square root of delta times 1 minus delta. And it's a measure of how noisy the channel is. So if delta is equal to 0, the butter career parameter is also equal to 0. If delta is equal to 1, that is equal to 1 means we have a channel that looks like this. So we have x equals 0, x equals 1. And when we transmit 0, we receive only always 1. And if we transmit 1, we receive always 0. The channel is not noisy at all because it's deterministic. So we just flip the output and then we recover the input. We can do very simple operation flipping and we recover the input so it's not noisy at all. So that's why in this case, the butter career is also equal to zero. When we have a delta of one half, Delta of one half means um, we just flip a coin every time we're looking at the channel output. So we cannot say anything about the input. And that means the channel is maximally noisy. In this case, the butter career parameter is equal to 1. So the butter career parameter is between 0 and 1. 0 means the channel is not noisy at all. And 1 means the channel is very noisy. And the butter career parameter can be used to derive bounds on the performance of a coding scheme, as we will see later on. So with this, we have um, finished the first, um, yeah, the first part of the lecture. We have looked at the channel models. Um, here is a little bit unrelated to channel models. We have uh, some useful facts that we will possibly need later on. I just skip them here for um, for convenience. So we have approximations and bounds on factorials, and we have approximations and bounds on binomial coefficients, which tend to be um, extremely useful later. And especially this last fact is the binomial theorem. That's also a fact that you should know, unless you do already know it. With this, thanks a lot for listening, and I'll see you in the next lecture when we're looking at channel codes themselves. Thank you very much.